Chapter Ten of Pagan Passions by Randall Garrett and Lawrence Jennifer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten. William Forrester sat quite alone in the room which had been given him on Mount Olympus. He stared out of the window, a little smaller than the window in Venus's rooms, at the Grecian plain far below, without actually seeing. There was no vertigo this time. Small matters like that couldn't bother him. The whole room was rather a small one as God's rooms went, but it had the same very colored shifting walls, the same furniture that appeared when you approached it. Forrester was beginning to get used to it now, and he didn't know if it was going to do him any good. He peered down trying to discern the patrolling myrmidons around the base and lower slopes of the mountain, placed there to discourage over-eager climbers from trying to reach the home of the gods. Of course, he couldn't see them, and after a while he lost interest again. Matters were too serious to allow time for that kind of game. The autumn bacchanal was over, a thing of the past, on the way to the distortion of legend. Forrester's greatest triumph had ended in his greatest fiasco. He closed his eyes as he sat in his room, the fluctuating colors on the walls going unappreciated. He had nothing to do now except wait for the final judgment of the gods. At first he had been terrified, but terror could only last so long, and as the time ticked by, the idea of that coming judgment had almost stopped troubling his mind. Either he had passed the tests, or he hadn't. There was no point in worrying about the inevitable. He felt anesthetized, numb to any sensation of personal danger. There was nothing whatever he could do. The gods had him. Very well. Let the gods worry about what to do with him. Freed. His mind turned over and over a problem that seemed new to him at first. Gradually he realized it wasn't new at all. It had been somewhere in the back of his thoughts from the very first, when Venus had told him that he had been chosen as a double for Dionysus so many months ago. It seemed like years to Forrester, and yet at the same time like no more than hours. So much had happened, and so much had changed. But the question had remained, waiting until he could look at it and work with it. Now he could face that strange doubt in his mind, the doubt that had colored everything since his introduction to the gods, that had grown as his training in demigodhood had progressed, and that was now, for the first time, coming to full consciousness. Every time it had come near the surface before this day, he had expelled it from his mind, forcefully getting rid of it without realizing fully that he was doing so. And perhaps, he thought, the doubt had begun even earlier than that. Perhaps he had always doubted, and never allowed himself to think about the doubt. The floor of his mind seemed to open, and he was falling, falling. But where the doubt had begun was unimportant now. It was present. It had grown. That was all that mattered. He could find facts to feed the doubt and strengthen it, and he looked at the facts one by one. First, there was the angry conversation between Mars and Venus on the night of the Bacchanal. He could still hear what Mars had said. Worse than your predecessor. And then he'd shut Venus up before she gave away too much, realizing maybe that he had given away a good deal himself. That one little sentence was enough to bring everything into question, Forrester thought. He had wondered why it had been necessary to have a double for Dionysus. But he hadn't actually thought about it. Maybe he hadn't wanted to think about it. But now, with the notion of a predecessor for Venus in his mind, he had to think about it, and the only conclusion he could come to was a disturbing one. 
It did more than disturb him, as a matter of fact. It frightened him. He wanted desperately to find some flaw in the conclusion he faced, because he feared it even more than he feared the coming judgment of the Pantheon. But there wasn't any flaw. The facts meshed together entirely too well to be an accidental pattern. In the first place, he thought, why had he been picked for the job? He was a nobody of no importance with no special gifts. Why did he deserve the honor of taking his place beside Hercules and Achilles and Odysseus and the other great heroes? Forrester knew he wasn't any hero, but what gave him his standing? And he went on. There was a second place. In the months of his training, he had met fourteen of the gods, all of them except for Dionysus. Now, what kind of sense did that make? Anyone who's going to have a double usually trains the double himself, if it's at all possible, or at the very least, he allows the double to watch his actions, so that the double can do a really competent job of imitation. And if an imitation is all that's needed, why not hire an actor instead of a history professor? Vulcan had told him, You were picked not merely for your physical resemblance to Dionysus, but your psychological resemblance as well. That had to be true, if only because, as far as Forrester could see, nobody had the slightest reason to lie about it. But why should it be true? What advantage did the gods get out of that psychological resemblance? All he was supposed to be was a double, and anybody who looked like Dionysus would be accepted as Dionysus by the people. The psychological resemblance didn't have a thing to do with it. Mars, Venus, Vulcan, even Zeus had dropped clues. Zeus had referred to him as a substitute for Dionysus. A substitute, he realized with a kind of horror, was not at all the same thing as a double. The answer was perfectly clear, but there were even more facts to bolster it. Why had he been tested, for instance, after he had been made a demigod? In spite of what Vulcan had said, was he slated for further honors if he passed the new tests? He was sure that Vulcan had been telling the truth as far as he'd gone, but it hadn't been the whole truth. Forrester was certain of that now. And what was it that Venus had said during that argument with Mars? Something about not killing Forrester, because then they would have to, quote, get another. Another what? Another substitute? No, there was no escape from the simple and obvious conclusion. Dionysus was either missing, which was bad enough, or something much worse. He was dead. Forrester shivered. The idea of an immortal god dying was, in one way, as horrible a notion as he could imagine. But in another way, it seemed to make a good deal of sense. As far as plain William Forrester had been concerned, the contradiction in the notion of a dead immortal would have made it ridiculous to start with. But the demigod Dionysus had a somewhat different slant on things. After all, Vulcan had told him a demigod could die. And if that was true, then why couldn't a god die, too? Perhaps it would take a lot to kill a god, but the difference would be one of degree, not of kind. It seemed wholly logical, and it led, Forrester saw, to a new conclusion, one that required a little less effort to face than he thought it would. It should have shaken the foundations of his childhood and left him dizzy, but somehow it didn't. How long, he asked himself, had he been secretly doubting the fact that the gods were gods? At least in the sense they pretended to be, the gods were not gods at all. They were something else. But what? Where did they come from? Were they actually the gods of ancient Greece as they claimed? 
Forrester wanted to throw that claim out with the rest, but when he thought things over, he didn't see why he should. To an almost indestructible being, three thousand years may only be a long time. So the gods actually were gods, at least as far as longevity went, but the decision didn't get him very far. There were still a lot of questions unanswered, and no way that he could see of answering them. Or rather, there was one way, but it was hellishly dangerous. He had no business even thinking about it. He was in enough hot water already. <sighs> Nevertheless, what more harm could he do to his chances? After the Bacchanal fiasco, there was probably a sentence of death hanging over his head anyhow, and they couldn't do any more to him than kill him. It was ridiculous, he told himself, with a return of caution and sanity, but the notion came back, nagging at his mind, and at last it took a new form. The gods had the rest of the information he needed. He had to go to one of them. But which one? His first thought was Venus, but after a moment of thought, he ruled her regretfully out as a possibility. After all, there was Mars's mention of her predecessor. If that meant anything, it meant that the current Venus wasn't the original one. She would have a lot less information than one of the original gods. If there were any originals left. He tabled that thought hurriedly and went on. Vulcan had told him at least a part of the truth, and Vulcan looked like a good bet. Forrester didn't like the idea of bearding the artisan in his workshop. It made him feel uncomfortable. And after a while, he put his finger on the reason. His little liaison with Venus made him feel guilty. There was, he knew, no reason for it. In the first place, he hadn't known the girl was Venus. And in the second place, she may not have been the same one who had been Vulcan's original wife thirty or more centuries ago. But the guilt remained, and he tabled Vulcan for the time being, and went on. Morpheus, Hera, and most of the others he passed by without a glance. There was no reason for them to dislike him, but there was no reason for comradeship, either. Mars popped into his mind, and popped right out again. That would be putting his head in the lion's mouth with a vengeance. No, there was only one left. The obvious choice. The one who had helped him throughout his training period, Diana. She genuinely seemed to like him. She was also a good kid. The thought alone was almost enough to make him smile fondly, and would have if he had not remembered the peril he was in. He turned away from the window to look at the color-swirled wall across the room. He had remained in his room ever since Mars and Venus had brought him back from New York and he wasn't at all sure that he could leave it. In the normal sense of the word, the place had neither exits nor entrances. The only way of getting in or out of the place was via the veil of heaven. Matter transmitters, not something supernatural, he realized now. As far as Forrester knew, they still worked. But the gods could generate a veil anywhere at any time. Forrester, as a demigod, could only will one into existence on sufferance. He could only work the matter-transmitting veils if the gods permitted him to do so. If they didn't, he was trapped. Well, he told himself, there was one way to find out. He walked over to the wall and stood a few feet away from it, concentrating in the way he had been taught. He was still slower at it than the gods themselves, and hadn't developed the knack of forming a veil as he walked toward the place where he wanted to be as they had. But he knew he could do it, if he was still allowed to. Minutes went by. Then, as the blue sheet of neural energy flickered into being, Forrester slumped in sudden relief. He took a deep breath and closed his eyes. The veil was there, but was it what he hoped? or a trick. Possibly he could focus the other terminal where he wanted it, but there was also the chance that the gods had set the thing up so that when he stepped through, 
he would be standing in the court of the gods facing a tribunal for which he was totally unprepared it would be just like the pantheon he thought to pull a lousy trick like that but there was no point in dithering if death was to be his fate that would be that he could do nothing at all by sitting in his room and waiting for them to come and get him he focused the exit terminal in diana's apartment there was no way of knowing whether the focus worked or not until he stepped through he opened his eyes and walked into the veil he felt almost disappointed when he looked around him he had steeled himself to do great battle with the gods and instead he was where he had wanted to be in diana's apartment she was standing with her back to him and forrester didn't make a sound not wanting to startle the goddess she was totally unclad her glorious body shining in the light of the room her blue-black hair unbound and falling halfway down her gently curved back but she must have heard him somehow for she turned and for half a second she stood facing him forrester did not move he couldn't even breathe every magnificent curve was highlighted in a frozen tableau then there was a sudden flash of white and she was clad in a clinging chiton which forrester saw served only to remind one of what one had recently seen it worked very well although forrester did not think he had any need for an aid to his memory my goodness diana said you shouldn't surprise a girl like that i mean you really gave me a shock kid forrester took his first breath well he said i could be dishonest not to mention ungallant and tell you i was sorry but diana said being of sound mind and sound body i'm a long way from being sorry and diana dropped her eyes and blushed forrester could hardly believe it but it did show a part of the goddess's personality that was entirely new to him he was sure that any of the gods or goddesses could sense when a veil of heaven was forming near them and get prepared before it was well enough developed to allow for passage but diana who was after all one of the traditional virgin goddesses like pallas athena had chosen to pretend surprise forrester had a further hunch too he thought she might have deliberately vanished her chiton only a second or so before he entered and that put a different and very interesting face on things not to mention he thought an entire figure but he didn't say anything that wasn't his main business in diana's apartment instead he watched her smile briskly and say well you're here anyhow kid and i guess that's enough for me want a drink i could whip up some nectar and maybe an ambrosia sandwich i'll take the drink forrester said i'm not really hungry thanks diana held out her hands fingers curved inward and a crystal cup of clear golden liquid appeared in each matter transmission of course not magic she handed one over to forrester who took it and looked the goddess straight in the eyes thanks he said diana i've got some questions to ask you and i hope i'll get the answers she touched the rim of her cup to his her voice was very soft but she didn't hesitate in the least i'll answer any questions i have to sit down they found chairs along the walls of the room and sat facing one another forrester took a sip of his drink settled back and tried to think where to begin well god or no god zeus had the key to that one he had said it years ago and it had passed almost into legend begin at the beginning go on until you reach the end and then stop very well forrester thought he cleared his throat diana looked at him inquiringly i don't know how far into the noose i'm putting my head with this one diana he said but i trust you and i've got to ask somebody go ahead she said quietly first question 
The original Dionysus is dead, isn't he? She paused for a moment before answering. Yes, he is. And I was scheduled to take his place. That's right. As a full god, Forrester said. Diana nodded. There was a little silence. Diana, Forrester said, what are the gods? She got up and crossed to the window. Looking out, she said, Before I answer that, I want you to tell me what you think we are. Men and women, he said. More or less human, like myself, except you've somehow managed to get so far ahead of any science Earth knows that even today your effects can only be explained as magic or miracle. How could we get that far ahead of you? Forrester took a leap in the dark to the only conclusion he could see. You're not from Earth, he said. You're from another planet. The word sounded strange to his own ears, but Diana didn't even act surprised. That's right, she said. We're from another planet, or rather, several other planets. Several? Forrester exclaimed. But, oh, I see, Pan, for instance. Diana nodded. Pan isn't even really humanoid. His home is a planet where his type of goat-like life evolved. Neither Pluto nor Neptune is humanoid, either. They're a little closer than Pan, but not really very close when you get a good look. The rest of the gods are humanoid, but not human. Wait a minute, Forrester said. Venus is human. Or anyhow, she's a replacement, just the way I was slated to be a replacement for Dionysus. Diana drained her cup and clapped her hands together on it. The cup vanished. Forrester did the same to his own. Correct, she said. Venus just... just disappeared once. They got an Etruscan girl to replace her. She's not the only replacement, either. Forrester stared. Who else? You tell me. He thought the list of gods over. Zeus, he said. Diana smiled. Yes, Zeus is a long way from the great hero of the legends, isn't he? Using the old calendar, Zeus died in about 1100 B.C., not too long after the close of the Trojan War. As far as anybody knows, Neptune did the actual killing, but it's pretty clear that the original idea wasn't his. Hera's, Forrester guessed. Of course, Diana said. What she wanted was a figurehead she could control, and that's what she got though I'm not sure she's entirely happy with the change. If the original Zeus was a little harder to control, at least he seems to have had an original thought now and again. Forrester sat quietly for a time, waiting for the shock to pass. What about Dionysus? Diana shrugged. He, well, as far as anybody's ever been able to tell, it was suicide. About three years ago, and it drove Hera pretty wild, trying to find a substitute in a hurry. I suspect he was bored with the wine, women, and song. He'd had a long time of it, and two, he'd had some little disagreements with Hera. As you may have gathered, she is not exactly a safe person to have as an enemy. He probably figured she'd get him sooner or later, so he might as well save her the trouble. And Hera had to rush to get a replacement? Why couldn't there just have been some sort of explanation while the rest of you ran things? Because the rest of us couldn't run things. Not for long, anyhow. It's all a question of power. Power? Forrester said. Everything we have, Diana said, is derived directly or indirectly from the workings of one machine, though machine is a long way from the right word for it. It bears about as much resemblance to what you think of as a machine as a television set does to a window. There isn't a word for it in any language you know. 
and all the gods have to work the machine at once something like that diana came back from the window and sat down facing him again it operates through the nervous systems of the beings in circuit with it each one of them in contact with one of the power nodes of the machine and if one of the nodes is unoccupied then the machine's out of balance it will run for a while but eventually it will simply wreck itself every one of the fifteen nodes has to be occupied otherwise chaos forrester nodded so when dionysus died we had to find a replacement in a hurry the machine's been running out of balance for about as long as it can stand right now forrester closed his eyes i'm not sure i get the picture well look at it this way suppose you have a wheel all right forrester said obligingly i have a wheel and this wheel has fifteen weights on it they're spaced equally around the rim and the wheels revolving at high speed forrester kept his eyes closed when he had the wheel nicely spinning he said okay now what well diana said as long as the weights stay in place the wheel spins evenly but if you remove one of the weights the wheels out of balance it starts to wobble forrester took one of the weights dionysus a rather large jolly weight off the wheel in his mind it wobbled right he said it can take the wobble for a little while but unless the balance is restored in time the wheel will eventually break hurriedly forrester put dionysus back on the wheel the wobble stopped oh he said i see our power machine works in that sort of a way that is it requires all fifteen occupants dionysus has been dead for three years now and that's about the outside limit unless he's replaced soon the machine will be ruined forrester opened his eyes the wheel spun away and disappeared so you found me to replace dionysus i had to look like him so the mortals wouldn't see any difference and the psychological similarity that's right diana said it's the same as the wheel again if you remove a weight you've got to put back a weight of the same magnitude otherwise the wheels still out of balance and since the power machine works through the nervous system the governing factor is that similarity you've got to be of the same magnitude as dionysus of course you don't have to be an identical copy the machine can be adjusted for slight differences i see forrester said and the fifteen power nodes another idea occurred to him wait a minute if there are only fifteen power nodes then how come there were so many different gods and goddesses among the greeks there were a lot more than fifteen back then of course there were diana said but they weren't real gods as a matter of fact some of them didn't really exist forrester frowned how's that again they were just disguises for one of the regular fifteen Esculapius, for instance, the old god of medicine, was Hermes, Mercury, in disguise. He took the name in honor of a physician of the time. He could have raised the man to demi-godhood, but Esculapius died unexpectedly, and we thought taking his spirit into the pantheon was good public relations. How about the others? Forrester said. They weren't all disguises, were they? Of course not some of them were demigods just like yourself their power was derived like yours from the pantheon instead of directly through the machine and then there were the satyrs and centaurs and such like beings that was public relations too mainly zeus's idea i understand the original zeus of course of course forrester said the satyrs and such were artificial life forms created maintained and controlled by the machine itself it's equipped with what you might call a cybernetic brain although that's pretty inadequate as a description vulcan could do a better job of explaining 
perfectly all right i don't understand that kind of thing anyhow well in that case let me put it this way the machine controlled these artificial forms but they could be taken over by any one of the gods or demigods for special purposes as i say it was public relations and a good way to keep the populace impressed and under control the centaurs aren't around nowadays forrester pointed out nowadays we don't need them diana said there are other methods better public relations i suppose forrester didn't know he was going to ask his next question until he heard himself doing it but it was the question he really wanted to ask he knew that as soon as he knew he asked it why he said diana looked at him with a puzzled expression why what do you mean why go on being gods why dominate humanity i suppose i could answer your question with another question why not but i won't instead let me remind you of some things look what we've done during the last century the great wars that wrecked europe you don't see any possibility of more of those do you and the threat of atomic war is gone too isn't it well yes forrester said but but we still have wars diana said sure we do the male animal just wouldn't be happy if he didn't have a chance to go out and get himself blown to bits once in a while don't ask me to explain that i'm not a male forrester agreed silently diana was not a male it was the most understated statement he had ever heard but anyhow diana said they want wars so they have wars morris sees that the war stays small and keep within the martian conventions though so any really widespread damage or destruction or any wanton attacks on civilians are a thing of the past and it's not only wars kid it's everything what do you mean everything man needs a god a personal god when he doesn't have one ready to hand he makes one up and look at the havoc that has caused a god of vengeance a god who cheers you on to kill your enemies you studied history tell me about the gods of various nations tell me about thor and baal and the original bloodthirsty yahweh people need gods now wait a minute forrester objected the chinese oh sure diana said there are exceptions but you can't bank on the exceptions if you want a reasonably safe sane and happy humanity then you'd better make sure your gods are not going to start screaming for war against the neighbors or against the infidels or against well against anybody and everybody there's only one way to make sure kid we've found that way we are the gods forrester digested that one slowly it sounds great but it's pretty altruistic and while i don't want to impugn anyone's motives it does seem to me that that we ought to be getting something out of it ourselves above and beyond the pure joy of helping humanity sure you're perfectly right and we do get something out of it like what diana grinned she looked more like a tomboy than ever before fun she said and you know it don't tell me you didn't get a kick out of playing god at the bacchanal well forrester confessed yes he sighed and i guess that bacchanal is going to be the one really high spot in a very shortened sort of life diana sat upright what are you talking about what else could i be talking about the bacchanal you know what happened you must know everybody must by now mars is probably demanding my head from hera right now unless he's got more complicated ideas like taking me apart limb by limb i remember he mentioned that diana stood up and came over to forrester 
why would mars do something like that and especially now and what makes you think hera would go along with him if he did why not now that i failed my tests failed diana cried you haven't failed forrester stood up shakily uh, of course i have after what happened at the bacchanal i don't pay attention to that diana said mars is a louse always has been i hear nobody likes him as a matter of fact you've just passed your finals the last test was to see if you could figure out who we were and you've done that haven't you there was a long taut silence then diana laughed your face looks the way mine must have over three thousand years ago what are you talking about still dazed he wasn't quite sure he had heard her rightly when they told me the same thing after the original diana was killed in a hunting accident frankly she seems to have been too independent to suit hera and i passed my own finals i she stopped now don't look at me like that diana said and pull yourself together because we've got to get to the final investiture but it's all true i'm a substitute too end of chapter 10